we were hammered because the listener put on this thing of like they're writing the new Seinfeld. Oh no. People can't expect Seinfeld. Like we're writing full house. They were like insane. They promoted it as a sophisticated, you know, cutting edge. And in fact what they offered to people was a flipping kid shop. So we're set up for this massive fall. Because, of course, we're not going to be making the new Seinfeld. It was a highly anticipated show. And that was, of course, one of his downfalls. We had way more hype. So we had that whole tall poppy. They're making themselves very tall. They're going to be Seinfeld. And then look at them. They're not there. And so we had a lot further to fall. People I respect are reading this going, I can't wait to see this hilarious Seinfeld-type comedy. It was so not what people were expecting, and I think the disappointment was right there from the get-go. Disappointment from the get-go seems to be a running theme in this podcast. Hi, I'm Jeff Houtman, and I didn't create Seinfeld. I created something quite different, a sitcom called Melody Rules, or as some other not-so-kind people have called it, the worst sitcom ever made. Our first airing on national television was within sight, and after a flurry of publicity and marketing, Melody Rules was the program everyone was waiting for. Anticipation was high, bringing us to the nitty-gritty, the moment when the show that we'd been slaving over, fretting over, and fighting over was going to air for the whole country to watch and judge. All of us, the actors and writers, were understandably very nervous, Because it wasn't just the viewers at home who got to see Melody Rules for the first time on premiere night. We'd never seen an episode either. For the whole first season, uh, they wouldn't let us watch any of it. This is Susan Brady, the actor who played Fiona. We were not allowed to watch it, and we all knew that that was because it sucked. (laughs) (laughs) I got the impression that 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 was the thing, of like, if we let this cast watch this show... They won't turn up next week, yeah. and and it w- and it will be awful. I remember sitting down and watching the pilot, and going, "Oh my god, what the hell was that?" Writer Jack Tweedy. It was like primary school kids had made it. Oh, that sounds really awful, but I mean, this is the level of production values of it. Um, we had expected to be much higher. So by the time we get to the pilot. And we see what these characters have become. I think that's the moment where I I was thinking, oh, that's what we're writing. Another on the writing team, Dominic Shaheen. We're just going to have to do our best. This is a bit of a Titanic, but, you know, we might as well have some fun before we go down. I think we we were all so involved. We just thought, oh, it's okay. You know, it's good. We're we're doing our best, and we're really, we're working hard. Writer, Laurie Dungey. And then when we watched it, it was like... Oh, <laughs> not quite as good as we thought it was, it was, or it was going to be. My mum was visiting from Canada at the time, and I was so excited to show her the first episode. Table historian and eventual table boss, Deb Wilton. And it aired, and she was just completely silent afterwards. <gasps> and, you know, if anyone's going to say nice things... yeah. <laughs> your mother and she went well 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 (laughs) (laughs) at that point I began to get the inkling that we might be in trouble I remember watching the first episode with all my friends I remember that very well (laughs) Elliot O'Donnell the actor who played cheeky teen crayfish I like kind of stupidly invited like all of my crew from school around to watch the first episode and we had a big barbecue and we made the mistake of like going up to the park and getting really stoned, like, just before we sat down and watched it with my parents, and <laughs> it was like a nightmare, eh? Like, the director, Michael, I actually remember sitting in on the editing session when they were cutting it, and there was a, a shot within the first sort of couple of scenes where it goes to, like, um, like where the telephone rings, and it goes to a shot of the, the, the telephone, and um, it's a freeze frame. No, really, I'll get it. And you can tell it because it's sort of like vibrating and it's just like real, real awkward. And I actually was in the sort of editing room when he was arguing with this editor about making it a freeze frame. And he was really convinced. He's like, now, now cut to freeze frame 
of of the telephone and they're like freeze frame like why do you want freeze frame? he goes trust me he like, <laughs> like, and, I, and i remember the guy just sort of like whoever was editing like he was on the board sort of looked up at him like what <laughs> it was so funny i just remember that was the moment where all my friends were just like they're all there and somebody just laughed who was like damn like <laughs> that's so bad <laughs> and then like at the end of it when it finished I was like kind of somewhat just sort of hoping optimistically that it was good on some level, you know, and I turned around to my friends. I was like, so what do you think? And then one of my friends was like, bro, I don't know how to say it. It just was maybe the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I remember like my heart would have sunk if I didn't know it was kind of true as well. And I was like, it was pretty bad. eh?" He's like, dude, well, at least you're getting paid. <laughs> I was like, Yep. <laughs> and after watching that terrible first episode, there was one element of the show that really stood out to the audience and to all of us who'd worked on it as being particularly terrible. It was something that we had talked about over and over as the one big destroyer of sitcoms. It was the worst, most horrible thing you could do to a show and to an audience. Canned laughter. <laughs> In an ideal sitcom, you've got a live audience. Director Michael Robinson. And it's, you're basically recording a play. You shoot each scene in sequence, and the audience watches a play, and you, you record an actual laugh track, which is real live people actually thinking what you're doing is funny. And uh, we couldn't do that because we didn't have anywhere to put an audience in this tiny little room we were stuck in. So I had to guess where the laughs were, and the actors had to pause and act as if there's a laugh there, and then we insert the laugh track in post-production. Mm, ten guitars and the girl from Ipanema. Well, when I stuffed some haggis in my cheeks, I started to sound scotch. Well, I like funny things. It's just that I don't get them. But I will be funny when I'm in the Gold Brigade. You're funny now. We didn't have a live audience. Like, Remember we had all the stuff about canned laughter? Yes. Should we have canned laughter? Well, who knows where people are going to laugh. Well, there. There and there. And there, we think, <laughs> is it a joke? And there, and then... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. We had these canned laughter boxes. It was just pre-recorded laughs that had been pre-mixed, and you just purchased. And you, you got to be real careful with that stuff because cause the audience quickly hears the same laugh, you know? If it sounds the same each time, it really sounds awful. And I uh, don't think ours is very good. <laughs> Listen, people underestimate the stigma of athlete's foot. Hootsman! No, you're talking! I got on the phone and I called up Ross. Matt Donaldson. And I said, dude, can we just not do the laugh track, man? That's, that's what we talked about. I said, man, can you just call all of your writers up? We will sit in the studio, play it out. We will, we will laugh, natural laughs. We will not need the BBC... Um, laugh MP track library. Laugh track library. <laughs> so what did the audience think? Well... You don't have to be the loudest laugh in the box to guess. The high hopes of episode one, the dwindling hopes of episode two, the oh dear we've gone aground for episode three, and then all oh, we're on a desert island from that point onwards. And by about the third episode I realised, oh my god, this is going to be a disaster. And of course they were already doing reviews, weren't they, in the newspaper and everything, saying this is a disaster. So... <laughs> TV3 may have invented a whole new genre in the laughless sitcom. The makers have made comparisons with comedies such as Seinfeld. Those comparisons look absurd. David Lawrence, the New Zealand Herald. I guess the crux for me, um, cut a lot to cut to the chase, is it was very shocking to realise and to feel the hate and um, almost like dis disgust that the reviewers felt. I still remember Ross Jennings' face the day that the reviews came out, when they said, well, you know, if it you know, barks like a dog and wags its tail like a dog, you know, dot, dot, dot. And I went, yeah, it is. The programmers have had the temerity to put it on Sunday. There was once a time when there was an unspoken expectation that programme screening on Sunday were of a certain quality. Jane Barron, The Dominion Post. 
So when I saw the reviews, I went, yeah, 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 it's crap. <laughs> My house got struck by lightning during filming, and it just destroyed our house. Like, major, major damage, blew holes in the walls and all this sort of stuff. It was a huge event, and anyway, that made the paper. And it was something like, Ian Chapman has more spark than the show does, or something like this. <laughs> As an actor, of course, you try not to read any reviews, good or bad, but you couldn't be sheltered from the reviews no, of the show. No, those ones. We were just being slated all over town, and I found that really hard to deal with, because I think, you know, we, we, we'd had a good time, and... I don't know, it just it was brutal. They were brutal. Obviously, failing in life is hard, but failing in a very public way is awful, embarrassing and soul-destroying. The audience and the reviewers were primed and ready for the show. They'd been told through publicity and promotion what to expect, and then they were delivered something very far from that. Their expectations had not been met, and now not only did we know that we'd created a gigantic, unfunny flop, but everybody else knew too, and they had no reservations in telling us so. People are mocking us. All of a sudden, it was like the car went... (laughs) and was kind of, you know, screeching around the corners with us kind of barely hanging on going, what? Okay. I remember my mum telling me a comment that a friend had made. You know, just awful, awful things. <laughs> she should have protected me from that comment. You know, just little things. Just, yeah, there was just, I felt like there was just vitriol in the air. So, yeah, it was hard to deal with all that stuff. We got these Melody Rule shirts made up and some people would never wear them. It became my paint shirt uh, because, you know, no one wanted to be like, you're a writer for Melody Rules and then people would say horrible things to you. So I was wearing a Melody Rules T-shirt, which was a stupid thing to do on the first day. So I was wearing my Melody Rules T-shirt to an audition. And I went to an audition just for a commercial or something. It wasn't anything major. And um, I was sitting there all proud, waiting, waiting in turn. And I overheard a conversation of two guys talking behind me, and just talking about how rubbish Melody Rules was. And I'm like, oh, can I get to the toilet and turn my T-shirt inside out? I could take it and then shrug it off and go, but what about my plays? But uh, for some people, it's not as easy. I'm sure you've seen this. There's a writing contract uh, clause you can have, which is the right to take your name off it. Yeah. And under WGA and stuff like that, it's in there all the time. Now, we didn't get given that option, but I've insisted on it in every contract since. Oh. Just in case. (laughs) And while the criticism forced me to rethink my contracts and my entire career, for the actors whose faces were indelibly linked with this train wreck things were bad on a whole other level. Like, I got punched in the back of the head at St Luke's Shopping Mall one day for no reason. Just, just by random. Yeah, just because I was on TV. I got jumped by a group of other kids at um, the gas station, and even the dude's mother was, like, trying to get a kick in. You know, there's that fucking dick from TV, and then, like, get him! <laughs> like, suddenly you're running, he's got his mum who looked like she is a pretty rough lady. And, like, we jumped in this taxi, begging the taxi driver to, like, drive, and then suddenly, like, they're all kicking the car. I mean, it was just, like, some of the shit I had to deal with. I felt really exposed, and I didn't deal with it very well. It was sort of so shocking, because it was the le- the level of kind of hate was so intense. Um, I got very depressed, yeah. I became suicidal. My 20s was a very tough time for me of my mental health. And Melody Rules was the beginning of that. (laughs) For all of us, the reaction from the audience and the reviewers was a surprise. We didn't realise it could be this bad. It was just a TV show. Why was everyone so angry? But one person did have an inkling. Our guru, John Voorhouse, the man who set us off on this journey, who by this time had already decamped back home to Hollywood. A lot of these industries uh, are places I'd go in and they'd all be excited. Yeah, let's make situation comedy. And they'd get one on the air and it wouldn't perform exactly the way I wanted to. And then the people at the high levels would get cold feet and they'd pull the plug on it before it really had a chance. John quickly knew that this was going to fuck up because he had gathered us all and chosen us all, you know, been part of the process of chosen us all because we were all wanting to make something like Friends. 
something hip and young and in for 20 somethings uh, and he knew that you know it's like you write what you know so it's like oh god these guys can't aren't gonna write a family sitcom but he, he did his best I think that Melody suffered the fate that most first homegrown sitcoms face the expectation is so high and it's uh, it's an expectation that can't really be met because the people who are doing it are doing it for the first time they're just trying to figure out what they're doing and there's not a lot of forgiveness for that you know we, we yes this is this is our sitcom and we want it to be great it needs to fail I don't know what went on in marketing for the show but I'll bet that they pitched it too high they, their own enthusiasm for it probably made them oversell it the audience has its own approach avoiding conflict with the material I want it to be great but there's something to be said for not buying into it I get a kind of a cultural arrogance and I think this is true of critics I want to hold myself above and and in judgment of this earnest homegrown effort Talking to John Vorhaus made me realise that we were always going to fail. And to be honest, that makes me feel a little better. The audience had been promised something that we were never going to be able to deliver. And while we knew that we were always going to be up against it, what we didn't realise was how much people were going to hate it and how much people love watching other people fail. The promotion only made it worse. It put us up on a pedestal, calling us the new Seinfeld, setting the bar very, very high. And then when people saw that it wasn't Seinfeld, in fact, it wasn't even as good as Full House, that's when the schadenfreude kicked in. And that's a good lesson, because even if you do your job well, you still have to manage the expectations of others. And if you don't, if what one person is expecting and what you're delivering turn out to be worlds apart you are more than likely going to fail. But it wasn't entirely doom and gloom, because in the face of all this public vitriol, I remember we did a good job of pulling together. Our relationships got stronger because we were all going through something terrible as a group, and only we really knew what that felt like. And often out of a burning mess... Through the niggles and battles and arguments, something very special can be found. I think David Geary and I probably clash more. Was there a certain chemistry, a tension going on there? I think in retrospect, I guess it was. At the time, I just thought he needed to be, you know, taken down a peg. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm being taken back in time now. Underneath that, it was that classic, I think, headbutting of two people who actually really like each other and that it was energizing, right? That kind of frisson. The wonderful thing that came out of... What, the most wonderful thing? The Dave and Deb story? Yeah. The B story was that we met and are now married and have two children. And then they just seemed to be this couple, which was lovely, because I think it made Dave a nicer guy. I think it made him more jolly. I mean, you know, being in love always makes you more jolly. And, you know, everything is more fun and effervescent and fluffy. There's a couple of kids somewhere as well? Uh, there's a couple of kids. I had to put them to bed before I could talk to you. So there you go. Two children were also the product of Melody Rules. What are their names? They're not like Melody or Crayfish yeah, or anything, crayfish. right? <laughs> <laughs> One's called Yeah and one's called Decent. Yeah! <laughs> That's what they are. <laughs> when I look back, it's also part of Melody Rolls the story for me is telling the kids this is the show where Dad and I first met. You know what I mean? It's like it has a whole other part of our history in our family. Yeah. It's like an origin story for the children. Which is awesome. I just want to see that as a comic book now. <laughs> On the next episode of The Worst Sitcom Ever Made, are the networks still in denial? Who says it's a failure? Why should it be seen as a failure when we got scripts, we got a pilot, we got a good cast, we put it to air? You learn just as much from so-called failure as you do from success. I don't think that's a failure. That's called success right there. 
The worst sitcom ever made is produced for RNZ by the Download Concept and Glynis Stewart. The studio engineer was Jeremy Veal. The coordinating producer for RNZ is Adam McCauley and the executive producer is Tim Watkin. If you want to catch up on this or other episodes of the worst sitcom ever made, go to the podcast page at RNZ or you can find it on most podcast apps like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Radio Public and Google Play. And while you're there, you can check out other RNZ podcasts like the new series of Black Sheep. The worst sitcom ever made is presented by me, Jeff Halpern.